Now the early AR-15s that Colt built, and this is one of them, have the green color stock and uh, I believe these are the ones that were sent uh, to Vietnam in the 61 time frame for the first initial tests. And that takes us back to sort of um, the resurrection of uh, the AR-15. Uh, I suppose if the Vietnam War hadn't come along or hadn't uh, grown hotter uh, with U.S. participation ultimately, uh, and certainly U.S. support of the Vietnamese, we wouldn't have uh, seen much of the AR-15 uh, in the long run. And this brings us back to that matter of timing. What do you recall of ARPA's having sent those, uh, Advanced Research Project Agency, having sent those first sample guns to Vietnam? What do I recall of that event? Well, it was a, uh, it was rather a hush-hush thing. I mean, they were trying to keep it undercover. And uh, we really didn't get much feedback on what was happening with those weapons once they were delivered over there. We, knew, we had an idea where they were going and what they were going to do. But uh, uh, I really wasn't involved in that part of that program at all when they, when they actually went over there. I saw a couple of the field test reports, and that was about it on the weapon. What was the long-term effect of uh, that uh, study? Do you well, studies? yeah, I think the long-term effect was really quite obvious. It finally, it was the beginning of a movement that actually started the uh, got things underway to start the adoption of the weapon. Uh, ARPA at the time, of course, it still is as part of the Defense Department. And uh, there were quite a few people in the uh, Defense Department under McNamara who brought in this so-called whiz kid uh, bunch from universities and whatever to help out in uh, their what, operation analysis and so forth. and. They were really not sold on going back to uh, going back or to a large caliber weapon like the M14, and uh, I think a lot of them are just waiting or looking for an opportunity to see something else tried. And this was the first time that uh, this opportunity came along, and they were more or less the instigators of this uh, field trials, as they call it, or whatever operational trials in Vietnam. When that happened, that started a whole movement of, uh, you know, the effecting of a large caliber weapon or versus the uh, small. Okay. They need for you to stop moving the, yeah. <laughs> the magazine. <laughs> it's picking in here and you're, you're more is coating into the... <laughs> well, we got a break here. Uh, okay. With the um, ARPA enthusiasm for the AR-15. Uh, the Defense Department, in effect, becomes now your advocate for the small caliber weapons as opposed to uh, the Continental Army Command under General Wyman. Um, what was the reaction of the ordnance people? Did they still ignore uh, the AR-15? I think that you say they ignored it, they, they acknowledged what was happening, but they were awfully busy trying to produce the M14 and get it, you know, all the quantity out that they could. And uh, they really weren't too involved in any, in, in any way because it had never been officially adopted by the Army. If it had been, of course, they, they would really get involved with it. But until that time, they were uh, pretty much hands off, there's much, much they could do. Uh, the actually the results of the first trials over there with the uh, AR-15 in Vietnam was, was pretty spectacular because what happened was and as we knew I'd been over there before years before that these the uh, Asiatic people being small stature and everything loved the small gun they could handle it they could fire it we were giving them 30 caliber weapons like M1s and so forth to try to fight with and they were just too large for them. And uh, I know that uh, you want to go digress a little bit in history when uh, Bob and McNoddle and I went over to um, demonstrate these weapons in Southeast Asia 
this was before the Vietnam War really got going years before, we took along AR-10s and AR-15s. And the reason was uh, these 15s were kind of left over from the Army's test program and pretty much given up on. And the AR-10 was actually what Colt was going to build. Colt was going to build AR, uh, an AR-10 uh, and they were picking up the license that the, the Dutch had. And the uh, Fairchild got, uh, became unhappy with the uh, Dutch license arrangement. And uh, they uh, decided to give it to Colt. Well, as soon as uh, we made our tour over there and had both weapons and I started demonstrating them, it uh, became obvious in the first, first demonstration. They didn't want anything to do with a lightweight 30 caliber weapon but they all just love the small caliber one. So McDonald, after a couple of, of uh, demonstrations, and he was Colt's agent for that part of the world, uh, said, hold everything. He sent a cable back, quite a lengthy cable, and said, stop any idea of producing the 30 caliber. He says, the only thing I want for my part of the world, and I think this is the most viable location right now, is the small caliber weapon. So Colt, on the basis of that cable, stopped everything and started going the other way. Well, when we got back into the test later on, uh, the DARPA test, or ARPA at the time, it was very apparent that this thing made a big hit because it was light and it was handy, and uh, it also had the stopping power capabilities that no one realized and became a very hot issue over there. And so... With this information, these people in the Defense Department who were more or less not enthused about the M14 seized upon this and started running some comparative trials of their own and making studies on effectiveness. And they came up with a paper that pretty well shot down the M14 rifle. So with that information and that pressure from inside of McNamara's own group, he stopped the production of the M14 rifle. And timing being everything, the Vietnam War started cranking up more and more. The, the advisors became more and more and started participating in these operations rather than being advisors. And incidentally, what was happening over there, the few AR-15s that were over there, the advisors started taking them away from the troops and they were picking up the weapons and using them themselves and told the troops to go find something else. So it was a pretty good endorsement. So after the uh, McNamara actually then stopped the production of the M14, that left the United States in kind of a peculiar situation. They had uh, uh, really no production military weapon at the time, and they were getting involved in a shooting war. And then Colt, in the meantime, had tooled up on these... Uh, AR-15s and we're producing them in you know larger and larger amounts. So here Colt was the only uh, manufacturer or only facility manufacturing a military weapon with a shooting war starting up. So in 1964, if I remember right, uh, the Army and Air Force ordered what was supposed to be a one-time buy of uh, uh, M-16s, uh, just over 85,000 for the Army and about 19,000 for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And nearly all of those guns wound up uh, in the Vietnam theater. Yeah, that was a one-time buy, and it was by orders directly from McNamara. And needless to say, the Army didn't like very well being ordered to by some civilian on something that they had always had control of, and that was the picking and ordering of their own rifles. And they didn't like that very well, and they wanted everybody to know they were unhappy. Colt seized on the idea and thought that they would make a deal with the Army and license them and gave them a very attractive offer on the licensing of the weapon, whereas if they bought so many thousand of them, they'd get a free license. And the, uh, what I heard, the uh, Pentagon thought that was the biggest joke they ever heard, that they, they told Colt very promptly that that was the first and last buy that would ever be made and go away. They weren't ever interested in making the gun. Well, history proved that was a little wrong. And Colt took great glee in a year or two later going back and telling the Army what it was going to cost them. 
So there was quite a bit of animosity got generated in that. But the, quite right, the first, uh, there was a split by there. One side thing, General LeMay, who was the uh, head of the Air Force at that time, had lost patience with the Army of ever getting uh, air police equipped with M14s. Uh, you know, the production was having problems, and he took that opportunity to break away on a, on a agreement with the Joint Chiefs of Staff that they'd all use the same rifle and said, well, I can't get the same rifle. I'm going to buy some of these uh, AR-15s. I can get those. So that started that Air Force buy. Then the uh, McNamara's people ordered this 85,000 buy, and that was going to go to the airborne unit, which was stationed in the United States at the time. And so that really was the beginning. And there was some curious things happening. The Army then was really concerned, and they're really upset with this whole deal. And I really firmly believe the Army wanted the whole thing to fail, the whole episode. The only thing that it kind of blew up in their face because they didn't realize that Vietnam was going to get cranked up the way it did. For instance, there was the Army didn't furnish any training manuals. They didn't even have a, a bore brush or a cleaning rod for these weapons, and they issued 85,000 of them. And luckily, the troops in this Airborne Division, being they were stateside stationed, liked the weapons, went down to the local hardware stores and bought their cleaning rods and their brushes and their cleaning patches, did their own maintenance work, and had no problems. They were then sent to uh, Vietnam, and uh, they had excellent results with the weapons. They were trained for the use of them. They had the equipment to keep them clean and went over there. And I know when Westmoreland went over to survey, I think, for Kennedy, uh, what they really needed over there, you know, to help them out after they were committed to combat, and the, uh, the answer was, we need more AR-15 rifles. And Westmoreland came back, told the president, and the president, I guess, got on the phone, and there was literally an open-ended contract made verbally with Colt to start producing. So, so now we're up to February, March of 65, when the U.S. commits first ground combat troops in, in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And many of those units, unlike um, uh, the airborne uh, troops, uh, went to Vietnam, originally equipped with M14s, and then over the next uh, year or so began to transition to um, AR-15s. Um, what happens uh, after that? Well, that's when things started really going to pieces over there. It, it's, uh, it was a very sad thing happened was the fact that once that big buy started with the weapons, the Army decided and were forced to get into the logistics, and therefore the ammunition logistics became very important. So the Army was put in charge of that, and they first time started to buy ammunition for these weapons, because up until that point in time, Remington supplied all the ammunition as a commercial supplier. So decided to make it legal and official, the Army then took over the task of coming up with a tech data package for the ammunition, and they did. And they specified rather loosely what they what they really wanted. And uh, that turned out to be a very bad situation because what they did do is they specified, for instance, muzzle velocity and chamber pressure and nothing else, which meant that the gas port pressure, where the pressure is tapped off to operate the mechanism, wasn't even specified in the in the uh, tech data package. So the Army then uh, allowed this to happen, and the ammunition that started coming down the supply line to meet the Army requirements was really loaded with a different propellant than what we ever used in the weapons before that. It was, namely, it was a ball propellant rather than the IMR propellant. Okay, let's, let's talk about propellants. Uh, improved military rifle propellant versus ball propellant. Well, ball propellant is a, a later type of propellant that uh, actually uh, Olin Winchester proprietary propellant for years. And it has the distinction of being, uh, it's a good propellant, but it has the distinction of uh, being able to be manufactured out of old uh, surplus or out-of-date propellant, whether for artillery or whatever, 
and it's cheap because it's a continuous process. It's all run through pipes and pumped around with different liquids. And uh, it um, usually, if you're trying to uh, trying to compete with it, with the old what we call IMR propellant, which has to be extruded and cut and so forth, uh, you make ball propellant cheaper because the raw materials are usually cheap, and also it uh, requires less machinery. It's pro it's the good points are that you can, it's a little higher density. You can get a little more of it in a cartridge case. It also has a little flatter. Uh, burning curve, in other words, it doesn't peak as much. It has a little, uh, to get the same amount of impetus, it can be uh, lower pressures. Uh, the bad part about it, in this case, the weapon was designed and the gas port was established to operate at a certain gas port pressure to operate the mechanism. And by going to the ball propellant, the first thing that happened, it increased the pressure considerably, therefore ran the firing rate of the weapon up. I mean, not just a little bit, but quite a bit. In other words, up in the neighborhood of two and three hundred rounds a minute more. Now, that in itself was a problem, but timing is everything, <laughs> and Murphy's Law prevails. And at this time that this happened, that this propellant was introduced to the troops and was almost the only propellant available is when these troops started going overseas that were trained with another rifle and suddenly given this new rifle with no equipment, no training manuals or anything, just said, go get them, fellas. And they, at the same time, got this propellant that was making the weapon malfunction, firing too fast, doing a lot of other things. It became really almost a disaster because they had weapons completely failing in firefights. Uh, it just became a real mess and became really the target of a in congressional investigation. The other thing that was found out about the uh, ball propellant is that all propellants have deterrents and coatings on them, whether and most of them have graphite on them to make them pour right, deterrents to make them burn at different speeds. Due to the fact that the ball propellant is manufactured in a lot of cases, it was in that time, almost exclusively out of reclaimed powder. Uh, the additives and the deterrents and all those things were relatively unknown, and a lot of those end up as dirt and carbon and sludge and you name it uh, in the rifle mechanism. This rifle had never been tested with that type of propellant. All the millions and millions of rounds we'd fired had all been done with an IMR propellant as the known, and then suddenly, without any, uh, you might say, really uh, field tests of any magnitude, they introduced this thing into a wartime situation. And either the lack of training or the propellant change could have probably been tolerated, but not altogether. In other words, when you put the lack of training, lack of maintenance equipment, and the new propellant pour them into the same situation all at one time, that's what caused the big problem. So it, it uh, triggered this investigation, of uh, this so-called i Committee investigation, and they succeeded in a fairly short period of time to get down to the bottom of where the problems were. And uh, I was completely unaware of this when this thing was going on. I was working on other programs, and. The first I knew of it, I got called back to Washington with a subpoena to set before the i committee and to uh, tell them what I knew about the rifle program. And of course, I could only tell them about the history of the thing and so forth. But then in that process, after I got through testifying there for a while, the uh, committee asked me to stay on for a while and read different testimonies and comment on it. And that's when I really found out the magnitude of the problems and what was going on, and I was completely disgusted and amazed and everything else. But uh, out of that, the committee decided, they identified who really the culprits were, but they decided in the interest of the morale of the Army that they had better not do anything about it. And i told me, he says, they know who they are and they will fix the problem a lot faster than we putting them in jail and having somebody else new come in and try to fix the problem. Because there were criminal things done, in my opinion, and also in the committee's opinion. And in fact, they said as much in their 
in their final report. Mm -hmm. uh, the results, one of the results of that uh, uh, series of investigations and a series of fixes undertaken by the Army and Colt in conjunction was the rifle you have in front of you with the black stock, which is the M16A1. Mm -hmm. uh, what things were changed on the A1 um, as compared to the earlier AR-15s? Well, before the, the, uh, this problem of the ammunition was identified, uh, about the only thing that <coughs> was changed was this uh, bolt closure device was added on. And that's kind of a, well, a typical interesting chain of events. The Army's chief of staff, I believe, were, had commented that uh, the U.S. Army had never had a weapon in history where they couldn't help the bolt close by pounding on something, like on the M1 or whatever. They always had something that, they, in case that the bolt didn't close, that they could beat on it and close it. So therefore, he thought that this weapon should have one too. And we affectionately call that the uh, Wheeler button, I think after the chief of staff of the Army at the time. And so they came to me about it and asked about it. And I said, well, I said, we've tested the AR-10 in this all over the world. And we, I really hadn't seen any excuse for putting this type of, a, of arrangement on because I said the rationale was that if the weapon is dirty enough or has sand or dirt or mud or something and doesn't close, the first immediate reaction should be is to open the bolt and try to find out the cause of it and not beat it shut and then find out you've got a disaster on your hands. Well, that didn't fly too well. And so they searched around with about a, at least a dozen designs on this to come up with this device. And the other interesting little side remark was that the program manager of rifles uh, got together with me one day in a hotel in Washington was showing me all these goodies that he had and and uh, he was kind of up between a rock and a hard place because he had been ordered to put this on and justify it. So he was trying to find a circumstance where he could prove to his boss who wanted it on there that this thing could be used in, a, in, a, in an instance where nothing else would work. And so the fellow being pretty clever with rifles, this was uh, Harold Yon, he uh, managed to take some good ammunition and take a pair of pliers and bend them rather severely, but they were clean and they wouldn't quite chamber and then be able to beat them into the chamber and fire them and the gun would function normally. And that was the, about the only circumstance that he could come up with where this would really work. But it satisfies his boss. They added another five or six or seven dollars to the cost of the weapon, and it's been on there ever since. So that was the the main change that was made to the uh, A1 series of weapon. And in the course of the Vietnam War, we bought right around four million of those. So that became a significant additional cost to the taxpayer. Well, that's right. And I don't know to this day whether it's really been worth putting on there or how often it's used or whatever excuse me, or what value it really is. But that's one of these little quirks that uh, when the chief of staff of the Army says, I won't buy it unless it's on there, Colt was happy to put it on because it increased the value of the weapon. Nothing else. Now, internally, the uh, M16A1 has uh, a chrome-plated bore and chrome-plated chamber part of it. That came later, though. Okay. The chrome-plating came in after all the ammunition fouling problems and everything, they found, and it's quite true and it's a good idea, that chrome plating the bore and chamber helped tremendously in using the, uh, the other ammunition, or any ammunition in that matter, under adverse conditions. They also changed the buffer assembly and made it considerably heavier so that the bolt group with this higher gas port pressure would run about the right speed. In other words, it slowed down the action to where it didn't break parts like extractors and things like that. So there were two, as I remember, two main changes made on it. And at the same time, they started incorporating 30-round magazines because of the demand in Vietnam. When we were 
were talking about the expense of uh, adding uh, such a piece onto the weapon. We were. <laughs> At the risk of repeating yourself, can you tell me why that piece is on that? And if you want, if you can lift it up to let it stand up. Oh, you mean this bolt assist mechanism here? That's to help close the bolt in case of everything else fails. But uh, I've kind of lost my train of thought what we were really okay, well, talking about. Well, what that. We, well, at that point, what we were talking about was. Uh, uh, that um, General Wheeler came down with the edict uh, that that needed to be added because the Army always had one. Mm -hmm. They had used, hit, hit the, the butt of the rifle or something like that to get it to close and other things and never once had the rifle been designed to have something to help do that. Are, are we trying to re recreate this? Is that what you're trying to do? Yeah, well, we have held like that. Well, and then Ready. Tape's rolling and recording. We lost our cover on the table, didn't we? Yeah, through the magic of television, we can cut into this, yeah. right? So I won't cut it. Do you need to have him grab it in the same way to set it back down again to cut to okay. your white shot? Are you want to talk about the A2 or not? Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. Well, you lead off. Okay. Uh, in um, the 70s, after all of the problems with the M16 had been corrected, it was tested by numerous countries and adopted by uh, quite a number. Uh, in the case of Singapore, the Philippines, and South Korea, licensed production establishments facilities were set up to manufacture the weapon in those countries. And at the end of the 70s, NATO conducted small arms trials uh, to sort of set parameters for the next generation of NATO weapons. Uh, and the M16 came out uh, on top uh, in terms of overall performance. Um, as far as I know, that was a unique experience because before that, uh, if a weapon once had a blemish on its record, it sort of disappeared ignominiously into uh, you know, the back room of some uh, depot and was never seen again. Uh, mm -hmm. But the M16 was sort of uh, uh, salvaged and has become one of the leading battle rifles of uh, the 20th century. Do you have any philosophical thoughts or other thoughts on, on that series of events? No, I think it was quite fortunate, but that's about all. I don't have too much comment on that. It, uh, it's like any other piece of ordnance. When you build enough of them, you know, you finally, you gradually solve most of the problems. And uh, it does take time, you know, in solving not only the technical design problem, but also just uh, assuring quality and parts and uniformity. And it doesn't happen overnight, but after, like, before those tests were run in NATO, there were several million of them had been built. So it had that opportunity over, say, any other competitor, that was for sure. Uh, do you think that military organizations generally expect weapons, um, both in terms of design but also in terms of the manufacturing period, to mature more rapidly than is really reasonable to anticipate? Well, I think they, they all expect them to mature. You know, that's part of the, the process. I don't know whether they, they expect too rapidly or not. Some of them take a lot longer than others. One of the, the biggest problems that historically has been when you have a design, such as the M1 or whatever rifle, and then a new manufacturer comes along, and then there's the problems that they, due to their processing or whatever, uncover problems that are unique, and you start the whole process over again. It's usually, uh, it's usually introduced by somebody new coming into manufacture. I think we've got uh, a lot of uh, historical facts that we know of in this country that happened both to the M1 and the M14, and 
the carbine and everything else. And even the 50 caliber machine gun of World War II that ended up with five or six manufacturers, literally ended up with five or six different types of guns almost. So that's generally more of a problem than anything else, I think. We have in front of us, uh, in addition to the A1 in your hands, the uh, A2 down front. Uh, it has a number of changes to it over the uh, the A1 to include uh, a heavier front section of the barrel in order to strengthen the front portion of the barrel, new shape of hand guards, a bump on at the ejection port to make it easier for a left-handed shooter to use it, fully adjustable sights, a more durable, supposedly uh, synthetic stock, and um, the burst fire feature. Um, this came about because of the work primarily by the Marine Corps, and, and this weapon is now becoming the standard weapon within the U.S. military. It is, in effect, a product-improved M16, M16A1, however you want to phrase that. What is your opinion on such product improvements generally, or the concept of product improvement, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Well, the A2 is, uh, I guess, quite an example of product improvement. And uh, as you can see, there are a lot of things added, but uh, Personally, I disagree with a lot of the so-called improvements because they were uh, taken into consideration originally in the design and uh, were uh, abandoned. For instance, uh, the adjustable back sight on this weapon is very, very similar to the sight that you saw on the AR-10 rifle with the uh, elevation knob and the windage knob and things that you could easily change while you're firing. I presented this idea on the, with the original rifles to the infantry board at Fort Benning back in, in the first AR-15 tests, and they were very emphatic on sights that were easy to adjust. They said that the their experience, and these were all combat experience officers, and this infantry board said that they absolutely didn't want any type of quick adjustable sights on any combat rifle. They said as an example, the M1, which has a marvelous set of sights on it, was probably the best rifle sight they ever saw for shooting at Camp Perry in rifle matches and the worst one they ever saw for combat usage. And the reason for it was the fact that nervous fingers tend to twist dials and knobs and uh, in a combat situation was the last place in the world you ever wanted to change the zero on a rifle. You wanted to leave it alone because there's no way to do it in combat. And they had found, all these, these uh, officers found, and they were unanimous in this opinion, that there was a lot of trouble with the sights on the M1 in actual combat use. So they wanted a fixed sight, and I talked them out of that and said that there should be a sight put on there that could be adjusted by with some difficulty, but just zero it in and don't ever make an attempt to, to uh, change it in combat. So this became a, uh, I think, a very poor choice. I know how it got there because the people in charge at the time were all team, what we call team shooters or target shooters. And they decided this was an excellent uh, opportunity to make the weapon more of a, a uh, target rifle rather than a combat rifle. I'm rolling and recording. Um, so you want to direct to this? Okay. Okay. I'm just going to take place, Mr. Stone. Yeah. Can you do that again for me? Yeah. Do it slower? Um, no, I'll just be on top of it a little bit better. Okay. I'm ready. Okay. Okay. The 
M16, of course, uh, has a lot longer association in life since you let go of it as a design uh, than you know when, when you actually were in control of it. When uh, what does it feel like as a designer to sort of cast your child off into the uh, unmerciful clutches of the people who manufacture it and uh, sort of take it from there? <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know. The I uh, one time or the other tried to get back in and make some some contribution, you know, to the weapon, and. Uh, it turned out to be rather a fruitless thing. I was told that, uh, for instance, I wanted at one time, uh, due to some field problems they had, to go in and I suggested to the Army how to uh, make the weapon a little better, and particularly in corrosion-resistant materials. And they said, well, that's real nice, and they would think about it. And so they got back with me and said, uh, this is going to cost five or six dollars more to make the weapon corrosion resistant, and we don't feel that it's cost effective to do such a thing. And I said, well, this is no consideration to the man in the field that's trying to stay alive with it. And they said, no, but that had nothing to do with it. It was the cost effectiveness that guided these things. And with that kind of a answer, I just kind of threw up my hands and said, there's not much one can offer as far as redesign or contributions to the thing. But there, you know, materials do change. and. Uh, uh, when these new materials come along, you'd like to be able to, I think, introduce them into something that, you know, this is, this is important as this. I think on this A2, this handguard arrangement is an excellent uh, improvement because of the fact that it gets down to one molding that does the, the work in, of two. And I think that was a good idea. Uh, I was, uh, I think, one thing that might be of interest to you, after this product improvement model was approved by the Marine Corps, they asked me to come up and take a look at it and have a, and gave me a briefing on it. And I commented on it quite frankly, and I, it wasn't exact, and they also gave me the uh, report, and I wasn't too impressed with some of the things that they did, and I told them so. And, and then right after that, the Commandant of the Marine Corps asked me to come up and personally tell him what I thought. And I told him and uh, what my thoughts were, and he thanked me very much and said, well, I realize what, where you're coming from, but on the other hand, the Marines did all this, and therefore they feel like it's more their baby. And even though that some of these so-called improvements you doubt, it might be better from a morale standpoint and all just to leave it alone. And I said, well, you are a better judge than I am on that. And if you think so, I said, fine. But I said, some of these things, it's just a pity to work so hard on an original design to make it light and then turn around and arbitrarily put weight on the weapon and everything for no other reason than it feels better and shoots a little straighter in a, in a, uh, on a rifle range competitive shoot. It has nothing to do with the combat effectiveness. The fact it is it's subtracting from it by making the weapon more heavy. And uh, we discussed the burst limiter, and I said that, to me, it was absolutely ridiculous, and told them why. I said, well, the experience that we had in Vietnam, for instance, the, all the original weapons had 20-round magazines, such as you see here. And in Vietnam, we found out that when the troops came up against the AK-47, which had a 30-round magazine, they felt like they were outgunned and all started writing home to their congressmen and demanding that they have more magazine capacity. And Colt immediately had to tool up and come up with a 30-round magazine because it became a moral morale problem, not a moral problem, but a morale problem. And. Uh, I see the same thing with your burst limiter. I told him, I said, the first time the troops come up in the field and they fire a three-round burst and the enemy shoots 30-round burst at them, they're going to feel like they're completely outgunned and we're going to go through the same routine again. The commandant said, well, I've considered that, but he says with a pair of long-nosed pliers we can fix this situation and take the, uh, the uh, three-round burst limiter out and everybody will be happy and that'll be a field fix. So. 
Oh, those were my general comments uh, on what had been done. And like I say, some of these things I approve of and some of them I think that they have nothing to do with making the effectiveness of the weapon uh, change. Okay, I'm rolling and recording anytime. So. All right. Who's moving? Um, Mr. Mr. Sonner. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, and this time with both hands, just pick it up. Put it back down again? You might turn it over and um, show that this is the same, same as this. As this. Two for one. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So down we go. 